girl have met before? I've seen her, but we haven't met. Oh, wow. So you we'll you just working? work this through together. Okay, okay thank you. Some She's the broker I'm owner. Broker. Yes. Yay. Do you have a mic on? I guess so. I, like, I, I can't believe y'all haven't met before. I don't think so. Oh, so oh, I know I got my cheat sheets here. Agents. Yes. Yes. When we were selling the houses over in Okay. Good morning. How is everyone today? Fabulous. Great. Well, thank you for being here. My name is Emily Chenevere. I'm the Director of Operations here at the Austin Board of Realtors. We so appreciate your participation in ABOR forums, and we're glad that you're here to have this conversation with us this morning. Before we get started with our program, I'm just going to ask that a representative of Austin Title, I think Roxanne maybe is going to come up. Uh, Austin Title is our sponsor this morning. We really appreciate all the support that we get for our affiliates. We want to make sure that you guys have exposure to the, the partners that we have in this industry that help us go and help us turn. So here's Roxanne with Austin Title. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Um, you know, I, and, and this is Becky and Cheryl. I want to go and introduce <laughs> my girls up here. Um, you know, one thing I think that we all have in common, right, is that no two files are alike. And it keeps us very excited in this industry. It keeps us going. We're never bored with what we do in title. I don't think you're bored with what you're doing in real estate. And it's all of the diversity. Diversity is part of what we're talking about today, right? And, th and that's what a lot of what we bring to the table of working with different people, different um, different types of property, all the different things our closers are having to do, our assistants are having to do to deliver the needs for what your clients have. And I think with that, when I think about diversity, the other side of that is really stability. And are we bringing stability to these situations, making sure that people walk away with that really great experience? So with our technology tools that we provide to our realtors, um, our Austin Title Agent app that helps you with your net sheets, that converts into 11 different languages. So when you're working with different people, you can convert all those numbers over to the language that they speak. That helps tremendously. Uh, down to, of course, we have bilingual closers in different types of situations for, for any person that's coming into our closing room. Um, we always uh, appreciate being here with the board um, and having a voice, I think, is very important. We all bring our voice to the table on all these different things. I've lived here 26 years, and I've seen the city grow in my time of being here and how we're all coming together. And I came from a town of 610. So I may not have had a lot of diversity where I grew up, but I had a lot of stability, and that's what kind of made me think about that. And, but, but when I moved here, I loved that I had this big city that all of a sudden I could call mine and go make a living and be out out there in and and have a career and I and we all take this very seriously here and really want to help you all in these transactions um, and then we have some other different pieces uh, just on the strength and I want to say with that it's not just the closing process that that the clients you know that we're we're making sure y'all are happy with but it really is about the title insurance something I feel like we don't all talk enough about but the strength of the company that you close with is extremely important we've been here since 1953 but we are backed by the largest title insurer in the country and we have five different underwriters that we own and we close commercial residential um, you know refinances and with all these different types of closings you have got an underwriter that fits that particular type of property better on how you're going to make sure it is insured properly for the future. So just something I like to put out there, remember this is something that your buyer walks away with and has for the life of their property when they need to call back on that insurance policy for a claim that they're with a quality company that's going to be able to back them. So thanks again. Um, we do have a drawing this morning. Do y'all want to put some cards in there? Cheryl, what's the drawing? Because I actually... Oh, Becky has a cooler. All right. Nice. Perfect summertime, right? Hard body cooler. All right. <laughs> Even though the sun has been intermittent. <laughs> 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 That's true. Okay, And she's on the panel. <laughs> so thanks, everyone. And yeah. And thanks to everyone on the panel and that y'all bring all of these great things for us to all learn about and the education that you bring. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much.
Well, I just, um, before we get started with our panel, uh, where the real expertise is, I want to be sure that you guys have a focus around the context for this conversation. Um, it's ABOR's hope that we are not just teaching you about the latest marketing fad or the next, next piece of technology that will enable you to manage your transactions more smoothly, but that you really understand all of the ins and outs of your marketplace and of the community that you're working in to help sell um, real estate and promote the value you know, of all of Central Texas and all of of its ins and outs. Um, and so a focus on understanding the history behind how this community has been developed and where we are today, and understanding both the positives but also the challenges associated with, with the way that our marketplace is divided or the way in which it is um, engaged today is really valuable and, and important to understanding a conversation about diversity in Central Texas and in Austin. So we're going to show you a few short video clips that are going to kind of add a little bit of content text to uh, what, what, where we are today and how we got here, and then we're going to engage this panel on, a, on we, what we hope is a conversation with you, not at you, about um, diversity and serving a diverse population across Central Texas and what the challenges are and what the opportunities are. So with that, I will turn it over to a few short clips. Thank you. It was a time when hundreds of thousands of GIs came home ready to start families but had no place to live. In the 1930s, the federal government created the Federal Housing Administration, whose job it was to uh, provide loans, or the backing for loans, to average Americans so they could purchase a home. Federal programs and banks sank millions into the home construction industry. Their message to veterans you can afford a new home. Buy a new home now. Tax dollars help make the single-family home a mass-produced consumer item. The American dream had a new name. Suburbia. We came to Levittown and we found the model house. And we walked in and we looked around. And, uh, of course, in the eyes of a uh, young man who was raised in the ghetto, so to speak, it was an interesting experience, interesting lifestyle, seeing all the new modern conveniences, very fascinating. Eugene Burnett came home with almost a million other black GIs. They had fought for the country in segregated ranks. They returned hoping for equality and the American dream. For many, that dream was a new home for little money down and some of the easiest credit terms in history. I went up to the salesman, we're interested in your home, we're interested in buying one, and uh, what is the procedure? Is there an application to be filled out? So forth, so he looked at me looked around and he said to me, he says, listen, it's not me, but the owners of this development have not as yet decided to sell these homes to Negroes. The FHA underwriters warned that the presence of even one or two non-white families could undermine real estate values in the new suburbs. These government guidelines were widely adopted by private industry. Race had long played a role in local real estate practices. Starting in the 1930s, government officials institutionalized the national appraisal system, where race was as much a factor in real estate assessment as the condition of the property. Using this scheme, Federal investigators evaluated 239 cities across the country for financial risk. So that those communities that were all white, suburban, and far away from minority areas, uh, they received the highest rating, and that was the color green. Those communities that were all minority or in the process of changing, they got the lowest rating and the color red. 
they were redlined. As a consequence, most of the mortgages went to suburbanizing America, and it suburbanized it racially. As homes in white communities appreciated in value, the net worth of these white families grew. For most non-white families who stayed in urban neighborhoods, the housing market open to them in the 50s and 60s was largely a rental market. You don't gain equity by paying rent. Where one's family lives in America is not just a matter of, of taste and preference. You have the issue of housing and wealth. The majority of Americans hold most of their wealth in the form of home equity. So that's their nest egg. That's how they can finance the education of their offspring. That's how they can um, sort of save up for retirement. Um, it's their savings bank, right? They're living in their savings bank. My family, like a lot of families, One of the biggest obstructions to me is I-35. I call it the Red Sea. It takes an act of God to cross it. In the late 1920s, the city council decided that we're going to pass an ordinance that every person of African descent who desires to have water, if you wanted to have uh, utilities, you had to move to East Austin. If you bought a house in a quote-unquote white neighborhood, they wouldn't turn the electricity on. When we first uh, got here, we learned that uh, incinerators were in the East Austin area. The airport was in the East Austin area. The dirty industries were relegated to those same neighborhoods. But then we built up our own nice community. My sense of community in East Austin was strong because you know, I went to church here, I went to school here. We managed to make our own environment, but now it too has proven to be desirable and people are now moving in droves. The price for a raw land has gotten expensive, for existing houses has gotten expensive. When we say we don't mind sharing, we didn't mean come in and move everybody out. Out of what were our neighborhoods. When you have somebody walk across the street and say to your face, we saved this neighborhood. That's like me walking in your house and saying to you, I don't like your drapes. Once folks have crossed that Red Sea, they're increasingly comfortable on this side. If you don't know the history, you may repeat it. And a lot of that history has been ugly to us as a community, uh, as an East Austin neighborhood. I grew up in the Guadalupe neighborhood, which we had a big divide, not only 35, but the other divide was 7th Street. So it was a line between, if you, you know, physically cross the street, that's where the African-American community began. And you would head uh, south. We said it began there, but people said that's where the Mexican community ended. The first place that I recall living was with my aunt, and she lived on Santa Rita Street. We live with my aunt because that's the first place my parents and I arrived at when uh, we immigrated from Mexico. It was a small town. Everybody knew each other. And we lived in a lot of rental houses, very poor. There's a lot of segregation. And we moved into the Go Valley neighborhood area. And uh, it was a, an area that was undeveloped. Uh, we didn't have uh, drainage issues for the water or to flow, and the creeks were undeveloped. As a young kid, you live for the day, you go out and play, and you, you know, you never don't really realize that you're poor or that you're discriminated against until you get older. So as we grew up, we began to see the differences between us and other communities in town. And she says, but I was born and raised here in town. It doesn't matter. You marry a Chinese and you're no longer a U.S. citizen. In those days, they would call you a Chinaman. 
And uh, my mama said, no, no, you tell them you're an American Chinese. They used to do a lot of shirts for the people downtown, the bankers and all that. It was not Chinese food, uh-uh. It was just plain old Texas American food. They sold enchiladas, steaks, fried chicken, you name it. I can remember him telling me the grocery business is a good business because people always have to eat. In those days, there weren't enough Chinese here to even constitute a minority. <laughs> they were more of an oddity than anything. Well, thank you, Jenny, for running those clips for us. Um, you know, I hope that I hope that gets to the point, right? That we are in an environment today that was systemically derived, that did not happen by accident, that we did not get to the community that we're in today uh, just by happenstance. And I think, you know, embracing that history and embracing how we have come about to where we are today is a big part of also talking about how we move forward and how we embrace both the opportunities and the challenges of the market that you guys work in every single day. Uh, so with that, I want to welcome Jay Renee Ward. She is a wonderful broker member of ours, um, a member of our Ibor Academy faculty. Um, you should come find her and instructing any, any variety of CE courses through Ibor. Um, but also is the immediate past president of the Austin area real estate brokers, um, which is one of our, our many realtor affiliated organizations that we like to partner with. Um, she's going to introduce our panel today. I hope that you really do engage us. You know, as I know Renee will welcome that and as you guys are welcome for questions just raise your hand and I'll hop over with the microphone so we catch them for everyone to hear thank you for being here thank you Renee good morning, good morning. Good morning. how many of you saw something in those videos that you did not know before you got here today yeah a good basics to have a conversation and hopefully we have experts that are going to help us have the conversation I'm really going to let them introduce themselves and then we're going to have a conversation about what you saw what you're seeing in today's environment, and then what we do about it, okay? So our first expert is Janelle. Please tell us why you are passionate, why you are here, and what your role is. And if each of you can just take a couple minutes to tell who you are and why you're passionate about this subject. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Janelle Krim, and I am the Home Ownership Programs Manager for Texas State Affordable Housing Corporation. I'd also like to introduce Janie Taylor. She's our Marketing, Communications, and Government Relations. Um, I had to write that down because I told her that's a mouthful. <laughs> um, so I'm really excited about being here this morning, and I'll tell you a little bit more about myself. I was a mortgage lender for nearly 20 years, and my experience with down payment assistance type programs, which we offer, were very limited because the county that I worked in was a rural county, and that county was very limited on down payment assistance programs because our city, our county, didn't offer those uh, programs, and then we also didn't have access to nonprofit organizations in the area. So when I learned that TSHAC offers down payment assistance programs to our low-income borrowers all over the state of Texas, I made it my mission with this job to make sure that every realtor and every loan officer out there knows that your home buyers can get free money from TSHAC anywhere in the state of Texas that they want to buy a home. Um, to tell you a little bit about our programs and who we are, um, we're the Texas State Affordable Housing Corporation fondly called TSHAC, so if you hear that, that's what we're about. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we were created by the Texas legislature to have the mission of helping provide safe, decent, and affordable housing to low-income Texans. And so that is a passion of mine, and I feel very excited about having this position and being able to help those home buyers um, seek their dream of home ownership um, with our down payment assistance programs. So a little bit about our down payment assistance programs, and by the way, the three minutes, that's gonna be really hard for me. <laughs> I'm really excited about it. You're good. Okay. <laughs> I'm really excited about our programs. Um, I put, uh, well actually, I put some brochures on the tables, and those brochures 
um, kind of give a synopsis of the programs, but um, we have two programs that are very exciting, and our down payment assistance program is a 30-year fixed rate loan and mortgage that has down payment assistance attached to that. And that down payment assistance that we offer is a grant to the home buyer. There is no second lien, no second mortgage. It's absolutely free money to your home buyer. Um, the other exciting thing about that program is that it does not require your home buyer to be a first time home buyer. A lot of down payment assistance programs out there require them to be first time home buyers, and this program does not. So it opens up the opportunity for more low income Texans to you know, achieve that dream of home ownership. Um, our loans do come in either government or conventional loan options. So either of those options are available to them. And our other program is our mortgage credit certificates program. And that is an annual mortgage interest tax credit program that is exclusive to first time home buyers. Um, but that program is very exciting because it gives the borrower the opportunity to uh, take a $2,000 annual tax credit on their income tax return every year for the life of the loan as long as they live in the property. And in the position that I'm in, I have actually had a couple phone calls recently that were, um, you know, I'm doing my taxes, I see this mortgage credit certificate option, um, why, you know, why can I, or rather they want to take advantage of that then, um, and they are asking questions about it, but unfortunately that program is only available for you when you are purchasing the property. So when I tell them that you have to have done that prior to purchase, um, they're really upset about that. And so then they're probably calling their realtors and their loan officers wondering why they didn't tell them about the program. So I'd really like to encourage you to look more into the mortgage credit certificates and maybe we could talk about them today. Um, but be sure and let them know about that program because they can't take advantage of it after they purchase the home. And as I said, it's a $2,000 annual tax credit. So that potential for them to save tons of thousands of dollars over the life of the loan is huge. Um, and so those are the synopsis of the programs, but Great. I wanted to... We'll come back. Okay. So, but also give them information. So if they wanted to get back in touch with you, what's the yes. best way to get back in touch yes. with you? We have our cards. We also have some flyers on the table that are our website. And if you look at that, we have two different flyers. We have one that is um, where our home buyers can go to the website and, and find a home buyer education program in their area. And actually, Frameworks is on our home buyer education list. We very much encourage home buyers to get home buyer education. And the way they get in touch with you is? Well, uh, my phone number. I'll give you my phone number. <laughs> I, we actually have cards there. Sarah is our home ownership programs coordinator. And unfortunately, I don't have cards here today, but I have her cards there. And we have a hotline number that's on that card. So feel free to call us if you have any questions. Great. Thank you so much. Ms. Joyce, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So good morning. My name is Joyce McDonald, and I am the executive director and co-founder of Frameworks Community Development Corporation. We are a HUD-approved housing counseling agency, so we're HUD-designated. If you go to HUD.gov and look for a HUD agency within the Austin area, you'll find Frameworks Community Development Corporation. We're the type of organization that the government promotes for education, counseling, default mortgage counseling, uh, financial literacy education. We provide all of the services that are necessary to prepare buyers for the home ownership process. And we do that through uh, a couple of venues. We have homeownership education classes that we hold every second, third, and fourth Saturdays of every month. Uh, second and fourth Saturday classes are held uh, from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., and those are in English. The third Saturday's class is held in Spanish language, and everything, all the materials that are in English are also in Spanish. We uh, see about maybe 18 to 24 students uh, per class. So the class gets really full. Uh, the way in which our participants engage in our program is that they learn about us through website, through going to hud.gov, 
realtors, lenders, we're on all the down payment assistance program websites. Um, there's just a myriad of ways in which your, uh, con your uh, I was going to say constituents, your, your <laughs> clients can engage. Uh, but it is so essential because it does level the playing field. Education always levels the playing field. Most um, buyers don't know that uh, home ownership is a process beyond just working with a realtor and lender. So we like to really drill down on the education. We use a national curriculum made uh, by NeighborWorks America, which is a national intermediary. And uh, NeighborWorks America, realizing the American dream is in English and Spanish, and it's a it's a wonderful curriculum, and it covers topics like credit, uh, are you ready to buy a home, mortgage financing, working with a realtor, and post-purchase education, because education should not only engage with the acquisition of the transaction and the financial responsibility and understanding the elements of mortgage financing and uh, how to negotiate a contract, but it should also uh, cover, and the title company and what, to, and we do promote title very heavily and because most people don't know what title policy is and it's not just the fact that your the seller is going to pay for the title policy insurance. What is that title policy doing for you for the life of the loan? But post-education, working with contractors, uh, it, being insured, being fully insured, what happens if you're in default? We want families to know that we're in the game both at the beginning and also after. So we promote if your home buyer is in default, come see a HUD approved counseling agency so we can help you navigate with the servicing entity who's actually managing your payments and dispersing your statements and understanding that world so that they're not clueless about it. But it also empowers buyers to be able to go back and ask the right questions and know how to engage in dialogue about this product, knowing the difference between interest rates versus APR. I mean, we really drill down. We, we, when folks leave our class, they're really empowered. The second piece of it is it, it's counseling. And counseling is a face-to-face -face platform with a housing counselor who's certified with uh, NeighborWorks America to discuss their specific financial profile in order to understand the difference between pre-qualification, pre-approval, uh, uh, what I've been qualified for, what I can afford, your current budget, your post budget, um, your back end ratios. I mean, we literally dig deep with that buyer so that they can understand that when they are speaking with their realtor, they pretty much know how much they can afford and what they can spend. And we do talk about all the down payment programs. How you and your clients can engage is by going to our website, which is www.frameworks. C as in community, D as in development, C as in corporation dot org. O -R -G. And going to the home page is the home buyer registration. And we also have online classes as well. But nothing really replaces the face to face. Um, let's see, am I missing any information that you asked me to provide to no. our guest today? <laughs> I think you're doing great. Okay. Doing great. Thank well, you well, so then, much. Thank you all so much. <laughs> okay. So Ms. Garcia, she's the owner of Casablanca Realty. Please help us. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. And yes, uh, going back and reflecting on uh, the videos that we saw this morning, um, I am very passionate about affordable housing in Austin, in Metro Austin. Um, I work with a lot of first-time home buyers, and if all of us here in this room are very cognizant of the, th of the fact that what is affordable housing in Austin? Even in Maynard, in Kyle, my folks are now having to look in Lockhart. So we are facing, folks, a very huge dilemma. We don't have affordable housing in Austin, and we have to find some solutions. So yes, we can, we can talk about down payment assistance, all kinds of a down payment assistance. That's not going to help my, my buyers. That's not going to help. We can go. I, I send my buyers to Habitat for Humanity. They have wonderful programs to help them get ready to buy a home. I've worked with Joyce. With, with, I sent my clients to her, too, to get ready. We, I sold houses that I work. I pushed the city, the city of Austin, for them to build homes that they can sell, 
that they can sell at affordable prices to these families so they can stay in Austin, so they can build the community, that they can build the economy. And Joyce worked with me, I think about two or three years ago, in the Montopolis area, they had like 20, 20 lots that were infill lots that the city then built houses. And uh, Joyce, I know, sold some of those houses. I was a listing agent, and we were able to place five low-income families. And we're talk talking low-income families, uh, minimum 80% uh, of the uh, medium income for the, for the Austin area. Those are the type of programs that we're talking about. There's other programs for people that make more money that we need to continue to push the city, to push the county to look at, that we can keep Austin affordable. I know that we have a lot of things against us, but we, we, there, there are creative ways to do it. Um, I have been working with people that are being displaced because they're in the Riverside area. Mm -hmm. There are apartments that are being torn down and people are having to be moved out. I've worked with those families, trying to find them a place. It's nearly impossible. So those are the things that I'm very passionate about, that I work with every day. And I know the facts. I can tell you about other programs that are very good. The Mueller Foundation is very good. You have to wait for, but there's two programs there. And are you, who's, who's familiar with the Mueller Foundation? And have sold, okay, I sold the, the, for those that, for first time home buyers and for, for the resale program, that's also really good. The, the, re, the, the Mueller Foundation will resell a unit. And if you have someone that makes up to 120% of medium income, so for one person at 63,000, they can, they can buy a resale unit. And that's really good for a young professional moving into Austin. They can buy one of those units. And so that's really good because they, they get to stay in town. So that's also, there, you also have Will House Community Foundation that is building Westgate Grove. And they're probably going to do another one off of, uh, I forget the name of it, that's controversial right now. But those are the type of things that we as leaders, as brokers and real estate agents, as lenders, need to be looking at. Because this has been going on for so long, we're going to be priced out. We, us, ourselves, cannot be able to stay in Austin any longer. So um, I have been a real estate broker for over 20 years. My office is in South Austin, and actually in the Bolden Creek area, and I'm about to be um, not able to afford my office anymore because of taxes. But yes, this is uh, not just because of people that cannot afford to stay in Austin, but it's also personal, I, um, uh, just for us as well. So yes, we can continue the conversation. I'm going to pass it on to Sandy. Actually, this is very, very personal. When I started working as a real estate agent, Sandy was doing education. She was doing homeward bound. And that's where I was working with my, my first clients. Remember, Sandy, when we were young and beautiful? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because we started when we were we two. two. <laughs> Here you go. Okay. Miss Sandy Batiste. Hello, everyone. So I get the fun um, opportunity to talk to you about lending and the impact. How many um, lenders are in the house? None. OK. So um, this is for you, then, as real estate agents, to know the impact on the lending side and how you really need to engage with your lender. We, we saw the video. And I, I want to give it a, a context of when you look at a house and you look at the external outside of it and you see that there is a crack in that house that goes down to the foundation and then you walk in the inside and you see cracks and you the doors are difficult to open and close the windows are difficult to open and close you pretty much know you've got a foundation problem right and you know that if you don't fix the foundation then fixing everything else is not going to work. So that's kind of where we are with the regulation side of the mortgage industry that impacts your industry. So now with looking at the compliance issues from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, 
your lenders are tasked with, you know, providing loans that are not creating a risk with a foundation that's broken. So I'm just going to give you really quickly a couple of statistics to put this in, in perspective for you. When the New Deal was created, and you saw some of that on the video, 1935 Social Security Act, there were two um, occupations specifically excluded, agricultural workers and domestic workers. So those were predominantly your African Americans, your Mexican Americans, your Asian Americans. So those were the low income workers that they did not have even the opportunity to engage in home ownership. So FHA was created. It had the same exclusionary practices. So just to give you an idea, between 1934 and 1962, the federal government, FHA, back to 120 billion home loans. More than 98% went to whites of the 350,000 new homes built. And they, they specifically, are look, they looked at Northern California between 1946 and 1960. Fewer than 100 went to African Americans. And I can go on and on. So what I'm saying to you is we have a systemic problem. And unfortunately, what that has led to, the government has tried to regulate that, but they haven't fixed the foundation. So we have the things like the Fair Housing Act, we have the Community Reinvestment Act, we have the really what started at the Civil Rights Act of 1966, which did not have any, which did not have any enforcement. So we have the Fair Housing Act that came along in 1968. So all of these, and now with the, the Consumer F Financial Protection Bureau, your lenders have the burden of trying to show that they're not discriminating against anyone. And you can talk to any lender. I don't think any lender, just like I don't think anyone selling real estate, is going to say, well, I'm not going to sell, um, you know, I'm not going to provide financing because of the color of someone's skin. You know, at the end of the day, we all want to get paid, and we can't get paid if we're not as a lender closing loans or as a real estate agent selling houses. So I want you to recognize that there's a systemic problem, and to me, the solution is education. So it's great what Joyce does at um, Framework CDC, but to me, it needs to start even earlier. The education needs to start in high school. We need to have financial literacy throughout, whether it's at grade school, junior high. By the time that student gets to high school, before they graduate, because not everyone's going to go to college, and that's OK. But before they graduate, they need to have a basic home buyer class. You know, if you want to buy a home, because that's what they're thinking, but they have no clue. They have no context. They may not have anyone in their family that has ever owned real estate. And so it's unfair for them to graduate thinking that it's going to be possible for them to buy a house, A, without having regular income coming in, what the significance is for their credit score, to have the ability to save money. Maybe they would be more motivated to go to a vocational or trade school to get the skill sets or go to ACC to go through a certification program that they can complete in six months or less and start working and gaining uh, income. So until we start fixing the foundation, um, and then again in college before they graduate as an exit, they need to be able to take a home buyer education class uh, because then it's more significant and it ties everything together of what is important and how they should be engaging and which jobs they should be hired for. I mean, how many of when, when you bought your home, did you have any idea of what that entailed? <laughs> so it's the system is broken. And unfortunately, whether you're on the lending side or the real estate side, you have to deal with it in your business. And to give you an idea just how, how regulated and the problem that it creates for the lenders, this is a recent, um, this was a recent finding for a bank that had to pay $1 million um, to resolve an allegation an allegation that it discriminated against uh, minority applicants. This was in North Carolina. This was fairly recent. Um, and so here is how the assessment went through HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which, you know, administers 
the uh, FHA. So it's kind of like, seriously, here, here we go. So it's, they stated, whether intentional or not, stark disparities exist in lending patterns, and this is what they're saying about this institution that they find, and access to credit along racial and ethnic lines. Um, and it went on to say HUD remains committed to not only enforcing the law, but also facilitating productive relationships between lenders and advoca advocacy groups. So what I'm saying to you is this, there is a systemic problem, but your lenders are, you know, they're held accountable. Your individual loan officers now with licensing, their license number, that NMLS number is on every legal document that goes to closing. They're on the hook for that loan, and it's tracked. If it goes in default, if there are delinquencies, that's how they're accessed. And, and, and you know, there's, there's not many companies that are going to keep an originator if they're continuously having loans that go into default. So you need to talk to your lenders and really understand the impact of when you're referring business over, what does that mean, and how does that look, and how is that going to impact them, and how are they going to be able to work with them? And if they want to get in touch with you? If they want to get in touch with me, the best way is on my mobile phone, 512-923-6782. Great. So I really want to have a conversation as opposed to we have experts in the room. So if you have questions, if you have comments on what you've seen, I see a hand. I am a lender, so I want to preference this by saying before I give the name of my lender that the views and opinions expressed by Sandy and Cortese <laughs> are not necessarily reflect the reviews of her opinions of Gateway Mortgage or any companies affiliated with Gateway Mortgage. <laughs> That's my disclosure. So it, it was Sandy Batiste, Gateway oh. Mortgage. Do you want to guys say your name and your companies again? I Joyce don't think they all McDonald. got it. Frameworks Community Development Corporation. And I'm Janelle Krim with Texas State Affordable Housing Corporation. I have some cards and handouts on the table. Ms. Garcia? Ms. Garcia. I'm Blanca Garcia with Casablanca Realty. I can't see it. Oh, it's too small. Okay. <laughs> Comments, questions? Yes, ma'am. I'm Susan Smith, and I work for Brigham Real Estate. And I'm just wondering, I have a, um, and actually like a friend who, I, who is a client and who is a single mom, but her income is basically, she's self-employed as a hairdresser and, a, and an Uber driver. Is, is there any, are there any programs that, that I can refer her to as a single mom that might help her? So I would say that the first thing she wants to do is take home ownership education and counseling. Uh, when a lender looks at a self-employed individual, they're looking at the most recent two federal tax returns, and they're looking at the business income that's netted as a result of the Schedule C with the deductions of expenditures. So most self-employed folks will typically write off all of their expenses, and so they may gross a large amount, but they net very little because they've written off a lot of their expenses, which only reflects a very small amount of earnings. So before we can even have the conversation about down payment assistance programs, it's more for that self-employed person to determine how much they can afford based on what's left over with when averaging the net incomes or if the net income from the, for the current year is less or more than the net income from the previous year. So the lender is going to, we're going to assess that to determine what they can afford. And if they can't afford uh, purchasing within the market because the pricing of market versus their net earnings is not comparable, then they need a strategy on what to do in preparation for a future acquisition time frame, which, which would in, in essence mean that the exchange that the self-employed person has to consider is, do I want to uh, pay less taxes or would I like to, do I want to buy a home? That's, the, that's really the, uh, the prevailing uh, uh, decision that the potential buyer has to make is, yes, I, um, I'm, I'm going to be on the hook for uh, uh, federal taxes if I don't uh, dismiss my expenses, but at the same time, my net income 
uh, is going to be greater so then I can qualify for more. Once we see that they're, they're earning income that can engage in the acquisition, now we can have the discussion about where do you want to live and what down payment assistance programs are offered within the geographical area of the interest of purchase. So that would be the direction that we would take as a housing counseling agency and I'll leave it up to my colleagues to add information to what I've just provided. Yes, and actually with TSHAC, we require with our down payment assistance programs that they have gone through a home buyer education program. Um, there are statistics out there that show home buyers are less likely to go into default on their mortgage loan by 33% than those who have not gone through home buyer education. Um, so it's very important and we require that and that's why we team up with frameworks and send them through home buyer education first. But as far as qualifying and programs out there available, our down payment assistance programs are available to um, either professionals in our, for our home uh, suite or rather, the Homes for Texas Heroes program, which is for um, teachers, firefighters, and emergency services personnel, but we also have our Home Suite Texas program, which your um, client would be uh, fit profession-wise in that, and she would have to have like an 80% AMFI or below. Um, and if you see on the table, I have some uh, handouts that one of them is our copy of our website and it's called um, ready to buy a texas home com at the top you'll see there that there is some highlights of our home buyer and renter section and that drop down box gets them four steps on what they need to do to buy a home one of those steps is taking our eligibility quiz which is a very simple quiz, it's about four questions. It determines if they qualify or are eligible for down payment assistance programs based on their income. Once that's determined, then we encourage them to seek home buyer assistance and call Joyce and go through that program to determine, as she said, with self-employment income, that is a huge obstacle for self-employed borrowers. So um, I definitely encourage that. And then as far as lenders go, we look for um, lenders who've been educated in our program and we have those lenders listed here. So they're very familiar with our program and can help the home buyers with specific questions. I, I would. Go ahead. Okay, I would also look at the um, neighborhood housing in Austin, and they have up to fifteen, fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars forgivable loan. That's that's for down payment assistance, and they can go up to forty thousand dollars. That's a shared equity loan. So and she that could, can be layered she, with our program too. She could buy more with forty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and and pay. and stay and uh, possibly stay in Austin. And that's one of the advantages of our program is our program is a gift. It's not a lien, so there's no second lien. And so it makes it easier to layer with other down payment assistance programs out there. So that's one of the huge advantages there. So she would have a, an opportunity to have both. And, and also look at the Habitat for Humanity program, where they have at West, Westgate Grove, because they're going also with down payment assistance. In some cases, I think they're going with a down payment assistance over $40,000. So I do want to add, I think we do need to start changing the language that we use because it doesn't matter if someone is a single parent household, you know, we need to start using terms like, you know, in, in, in reference to that particular client to say that there are programs available based on your income eligibility. You know, we need to start using those words as opposed to someone thinking because they're a single parent or, or income, you know, um, low income. I hate that. I hate that term. You know, so we need to start using income eligibility. And, you, you know, start saying there are programs that are available based on they have income eligibility guidelines. What you need to determine if you're self-employed is how your income is going to be evaluated. So I'm going to recommend that you start with home by education and counseling. We need to start changing the words so we can reset the expectation. There's no such program out there just because someone is a single parent that's going to mage, wage, uh, wave a magic wand to get them into a house. That, that is so true. That, <laughs> very true. Um, so as far as the the home buyer education program. I know people that are contract workers that if they had changed the way that they license themselves, like if they were to incorporate, they could have paid less taxes or made themselves in a different tax bracket. Is there anything in your homeowner's education programs that helps people to kind of navigate 
that process? Where no, we don't deal with the, we don't drill down that deep. Um, we don't we don't deal with corporate incorporations LLCs and how you structure your business to determine. I think if that, if I'm understanding yes, your question exactly. correctly, we we're not mandated by HUD to provide that information because that's legal in nature, and it's uh, it's it's because it's legal because it's dealing with how you structure your business versus the tax bracket or how mm -hmm. your organization is taxed. That becomes a legal mandate, and so they need to meet with a certified public account. Uh, for that kind of advice, or a tax advisor, or an attorney for that kind of information. I think that's very. I think that is paramount to know um, when you're starting out as an entrepreneur or self-employed individual. What's the best way to structure your business in order to determine whether you embrace the losses or the gains if you are in a corporate a S corporation or C corporation, if you're an LLC or L, a limited partnership. Those type of legal structures are um, within the uh, discussion of someone who's licensed to practice law or a CPA who's licensed to practice tax um, preparation and can give that type of legal advice. So I would advise just as a uh, aggregate discussion amongst the room is when you are dealing with self-employed individuals to have that conversation with them because maybe the structure of their business makes a significant difference of how much they earn and how they earn if they're a W-2 employee to their business or if they're W-9 or you know whatever that structure is in their best interest to help make sure that their residual income or their net their earnings is more fruitful or, or more profitable in order to be able to move into asset acquisition and investing so great and point. how soon right right how so soon. how soon they want to purchase right exactly. because when we do that entity we do it for legal reasons yep. for liability yep. and then we do it for tax reasons right. to either avoid tax or save taxes those are two different things Correct. and as a self-employed person raise your hands <laughs> right we know that when it gets closer to the time we want to apply for a loan we may have to change how we file taxes yes or yes Yes. yes, go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Christy, and I'm a newer agent with Keller Williams. And what I'm finding is I'm pretty excited when you get an eligible buyer. <laughs> and I've had a few, and it's very frustrating, as you said, Blanca, when you can't get them a home in the areas that they're excited about. And so what I'm seeing is I feel like I'm steering a little bit. Is that the right word? When you steer someone to a different neighborhood based on here's what you're going to get. Um, and I've lost a few buyers who went back into leasing, and they were eligible, right. uh, but they just couldn't afford to live in Fluvial, Round Rock, um, Central, Correct. and they didn't want to go out to um, Huddle or Maynard and these places where, so I don't know, what language can we kind of help our clients to educate them a little bit more on what's available? Because the realities are, it's, they can't. So as, as uh, uh, Blanca was saying, and I have an, uh, an administrative assistant whose name is Blanca, so I shouldn't be forgetting that. <laughs> <laughs> but as Blanca was saying, the most lucrative down payment assistance program, but it's only focused within the Austin proper, per, uh, Austin uh, purpose jurisdiction, which is also known as the Austin proper, is the city of Austin's uh, shared, shared equity, equity program. Mm -hmm. The shared equity program is a down payment assistance program that allows up to $40,000 in assistance that can be used to gap a buyer up. So if a buyer is ab it's able to qualify for 140, for instance, this 40,000 is gonna gap them up to 180. And so now their purchasing power is 180. Their loan is 140. The second lien, which uh, it is a second lien, a 0% interest second lien, uh, is the $40,000. And so now they're able to look for houses within a larger price point or, you know, up to that price, that, that new price point. That second lien is forgivable after 10 years at 0% interest, so there's no payment. Um, required, but at the point of, and they have to stay in the home for 10 mm -hmm. years. There's an the, affordability period. Yeah, there's an affordability period, so thank you. There's an affordability period where they have to stay in the home for 10 years, and then after 10 years, they don't have to pay that 40000 or what, whatever that amount is back, but when they sell the home, they have to share with that percentage of the $40,000, $40, what, what the $40,000 represented in the percentage of the overall purchase. Right. So if the purchase represented 38% of the overall acquisition price, right, then they have to share 38% of their equity with the city. Does that make sense? And it is based on 80% MFI income and below, 
and um, it's a great opportunity for someone to be able to find housing above and beyond their purchase price. The other down payment programs are basically for the purposes of helping to uh, pay closing costs. And so, um, but when you're looking at someone who's out of their, their purchase price is out of the purchasing market, the question becomes what programs are available to help gap them up to make, give them a higher purchasing bracket. And right now, the 40,000 shared equity program is that, but they have to want to live in Austin, the Austin city limits or the Austin city proper. It's called, uh, it's the city of Austin. It's one of the, it's, it's, one, it's a down payment assistance program with the city of Austin. If you go to, you go to austintexas.gov and you look for housing, you drop, you look at the department link, you go to the department and you look at uh, hit neighbor, the drop down link. Housing. Well, you have to go to the department uh, link first, yeah. press the drop down screen and look for housing. When you press the link housing, that link is gonna take you to the down payment assistance screen. And when you get to the screen, you're gonna be able to choose down payment assistance and it will discuss the difference between their shared equity, it's the called the payment. Austin DPA shared equity program, versus their down payment assistance program, which is up to $15,999. Uh, $15, and the one and I'm they talking do, about And they do do the training 000. also for real estate agents. I don't know if they're doing, they're doing the training with you because anymore. Because we work very closely with all the down payment programs right now. They're not providing training. They, at some point, were providing training for lenders mm -hmm. and realtors. They've done some training with lenders. They are not, at this point, providing training for realtors. However, I would encourage you as a realtor to call 574-512-974-3100 uh, 974-3100, which is a down payment assistance program, and ask to speak with the program manager and ask if there is an opportunity for you to meet with the program manager to discuss their down payment assistance program so you can have a, a clear understanding of how it works because as a realtor you should know how these down payment programs work so you understand and know which lenders are providing um, who the lenders that are certified to provide the various types of down payment programs so it interfaces your education with what the lender knows but your first interaction with the buyer is to promote the options that are available and I will say that on ABOR's website there's a list of all the down payment programs on ABOR's website. So that's your first interaction, but call the program administrators and ask to have one face-to-face -on -face meetings to discuss and understand the elements and the dynamics of how these programs work. And I actually have something that I'd like to add to that in reference to having a home buyer that qualifies, but you just can't find a home in their price range. Is that, that the issue? So the mortgage credit, right. So the mortgage credit certificate that I was talking about earlier that will help your home buyer um, receive as, up to as much of a $2,000 tax credit each year, FHA allows your home buyer to also use that for qualifying. So we can add $166 per month to their income and use that to increase the amount of a home that they can qualify for. So that's just something else to help them with a little bit of extra income to um, possibly purchase in the Austin area that they're looking at. Let me also encourage you that this is an ongoing educational process, right? Because if you're not working in Austin, those programs aren't for you. But that doesn't mean that Williamson County doesn't have another set of programs that if you're working in Williamson County that you need to be familiar with those programs. And by the way, they change. Mm -hmm. yes. They change. So you can't go to a class and say, oh, I got it. Because next month they're going to change to something else. So it's an ongoing process that you must keep yourself so that you can become the expert in the eyes of your client. Yes? Yes. Um, let's say I find a client that has a, uh, it qualifies for low-income housing and they move in. Is there any forecasting on tax appraisals to kind of forecast down the line because suddenly the first year they qualify and then you get this exploding appraisal market and two or three years down the line they can't afford it. So is there any way to kind of offset that with any kind of uh, forecasting to look at what something may be because I know it's all over the map with appraisals but you know just to make sure they don't get into a house and then two or three years later it's it's just so far out there they can't afford it. You are definitely encouraging them to file their um, homestead exemption right away, of course, right? right. Okay, just. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I think, <laughs> I think the, the key is also education. So when they go through the home bar education component, um, one of the components of that is the maintenance after. And part of the maintenance after is understanding that your property taxes are probably going to be increasing, which means your um, insurance on that property can also be increasing. That's why education is critical. But they're also building an asset, so there's that part of it. But the expectation is that they have to be prepared that, yes, your property taxes will probably be increasing. And they, you know, it may be that they also need to get more educational skills with their work skills so they can start making more money. So that's the importance of home buyer education and counseling so they understand it's not static. Just because they're on a fixed rate mortgage doesn't mean that the property taxes and insurance will not be changing. And to add to that point, I don't know of any forecasting future. I know that Austin is a booming market, so is Central Texas, and therefore property values are going to continue to elevate. So the forecast right now is growing economy, you know, <laughs> economic development, expansion, increase. Austin is on er, the Central Texas area, Dallas, San Marcos, San Antonio. For, uh, uh, Houston, they're all on the top cities to live in. So that's going to keep growing. The other t uh, element that I would like to add to that is when someone's buying a home, they have to think, uh, how do I manage my money and am I saving? Am I putting money away? And they have to start thinking, putting money away in, in, in investment venues like money market accounts that may earn a little more interest than your, your historical savings accounts. They have to become Investors, they have to look at ways to sock money away to be able to respond because they, if they don't get increases in their, because the incomes are not growing comparable to home values and the economy. So the responsibility on a home buyer is that I have to start saving, I have to start putting money away, I have to have that discretionary income to support. Although I've applied for homestead exemption, what am I doing with my money? And do I have the ability to keep up with the rising values of property? which includes taxes. They have to shop for homeowner's insurance every year. They don't have to keep the same homeowner's insurance policy that they have. They should be doing a comparable shopping every year before they renew that policy. So it's about financial management and financial coaching. Let me I, go I, do know, I, I have a comment, though. Sure. I do know that on the, some of the programs, like, for example, the uh, Westgate Grove community, that they're buying, the, if the purchaser is buying the affordable price, they're going to be taxed at the affordable price. I do want to say that I'm not quite certain if that taxation on the affordable price will remain constant. So we probably want to, because I know- It, it, it will it, be. It, it, will be. Uh, it, will, okay. it was just, I, I happened to serve on the board of the appraisal district, and it was um, passed. Oh, good, okay. Good. Thank you. I just wanted to quickly also comment um, in, in response to Jay Renee's war heed, heed to you that these programs change and that they fluctuate, that part of being a member of the Austin Board of Realtors MLS system is having access to a program called Down Payment Resource, which pairs uh, down payment assistance programs with specific properties, in part because they are always fluctuating. So to have an entity that is managing this fluctuating market of programs available to your buyers um, and, and pair that, layer that within the MLS, really puts that information at your fingertips if you are accessing it. And it's incumbent upon you to be engaged with how those programs are changing, where they are, you know, how, when they are available, and utilize that tool in an effort you know, to better promote what is available and what's out there. Thank you. I think one of the biggest things is education for both your buyer and you. And to team with a lender that is going to educate the buyer versus saying, yeah, I get your loan, and they come to find out that they really can't. Yeah. I mean, I work with a team of lenders that are honest with people, and they will tell the customer that, no, you can't do this. You have to do this first. Mm -hmm. And they'll actually guide course. the customer through the loan process as we guide them through the purchase process. It's a team. It is a very team. So, and it has to be very transparent because the last thing a lender wants to do is to say to someone, well, I don't know why your agent is showing you houses over there because, you know, this is, this is it right here. This is where the number, so it's very much a team in setting and managing that expectation. Well, example, me, I'm working with a client right now that uh, <clears throat> was $2,000 over the Westgate project. So he doesn't qualify for that, but we work. He's working with. I've got him working with a lender that's being honest with him. Yet they went by a builder <clears throat> who's telling them that they can afford 
twenty to twenty five thousand dollars above mm -hmm. what my lender is telling them and we're trying to coach them is like, well they said they can buy it. It's like, no you can't. This is what you have to look at. If you buy now, this is what you're gonna be appraised at. Two years from now, you're gonna be over here, your taxes are gonna go up, your insurance is gonna go up, which is gonna affect the amount you're gonna be paying. Are you gonna be making three hundred dollars a month more two years be from now? Because, you don't know that. Because some of the builders what they do and historically, what they've been doing is that they're selling the, the or they're appraising the properties for the buyers on unimproved property. property. Yeah. And then a year or two later, their taxes go up. And, and, and when I was a loan see. officer, they're calling me, going, "My that's payment went up three hundred dollars a month. I can't afford my payment. Can you refinance and that's me?" That's been my and fight when I sell those houses. That please do the escrow on improved property. Yeah. But I, but I had to have a one-on-one -on -one of them last night. It says like, "This is where you're at." This lender is telling you the truth. This is a builder. They've got deep pockets to play around with things to make it look like you're going to get into the house. They have their own lender and they have their own title company. But it, it was also helpful that you knew that to be able to tell yes. them because otherwise a lot of realtors that I've worked with in the past didn't know that necessarily. And like I said, two or three years down the line, I yes. was getting phone calls saying, I can't afford my house anymore. Yes. Can you refinance me? Yes. But unfortunately, they don't qualify at that higher payment. Right. Have you noticed in dealing with your clients that only one of your titles is realtor? I'm sorry, I'm question. Comma, educator, comma, psychologist, <laughs> comma, financial advisor, oh, yes. comma, do, do you know what I mean? And because they trust you, mm -hmm. because they have a relationship with you, they're going to be more likely to believe what you tell them. Yes. It is important that you know so that what you're telling them is the truth. What you're telling them comes from a place of knowledge. What you're telling them won't get them in trouble two years down the road. Right. And the only way you know is that you get the information so that you have the information to share with someone else. Yes? Here's the other thing. It is important, my job, I'm going to say for Renee, is not only to get them to house, but to make sure that they can stay in that house. That's right. Not only to get them in job, but I would be unethical Right? If I didn't make sure that next year they could still make their payments, that I didn't tell them that next year you know it's going to go up, you should put money aside because we just did this based off of land alone. And when the improvements come, you should have enough money set aside to pay them. And when they call you and say, you're going to have to sell the house, I can no longer afford it. <laughs> Unfortunately, there won't be any other place that they can afford. Yeah. So to, to add to that, one of the things I always ask buyers before I start the pre-qualification process, I ask them this question, how much do you feel comfortable in making a monthly payment? Now that you're going to be trained, you know, how much do you pay now in rent? How much do you feel comfortable? Let's not talk about what you're going to pre-qualify for yet. How much do you feel comfortable with a mortgage payment? I want you to write that number down. And so, because as they get more involved in the process, they may qualify for a lot more than what they feel comfortable in a payment. And if those two are not reconciled, you're typically going to have a meltdown before closing. So for the gentleman, one of the things you may want to ask that person, your client, is, so tell me, how much do you feel comfortable in a payment? Get it down to payments and have them tell you that. Another way of saying that is just because they give you the money don't mean you need to take it. Right. You know, because then the reality, this is what your payment's going to be, but you're telling me you're comfortable with your payment here. You know, so if they're saying, well, I'm comfortable with a payment of 1200 well, your payment's going to be 1600 a month. That's a big difference. So when you start ter talking in terms of payment, then that may give them a reality check. And they, they may go, well, no, I, I can't afford that. I, I have two questions for you, but I do want to add something to what we're talking about. And um, I have a friend who I actually, she got a, she had a realtor before I met her and they already had signed an agreement. She was going to help buy and sell. So, um, you know, she pretty much did all her own work and looking for a new builder. And I told her about a, a few communities and she went to them. I said, just have your realtor check them out with you, look into them, you know, all that good stuff. And so she did. And she recently actually just last week came to me bawling and said, my lender's asking me to come with $4,000 more to closing just for taxes. And this is in Via Sorrento um, with D.R. Horton, which we all know in that area the tax rates are extremely high. And I said, 
this is literally, you know, they've been in the process of purchasing this spec already for a few months, so this just threw them off guard. So at that point, obviously, I don't know their contract with D.R. Horton, you know, to help her, and I can't advise her fully because I'm not her realtor, you know, but I did tell her, you know, hey, go ahead and talk to your realtor, your lender, and the builder. Um, but this is such a surprise for someone to have $4,000 additional to bring just for taxes. That's a lot of money to me, $4,000. I can understand maybe 1000 that, you know, oh, if this came up, you know, you need to bring an extra 1000 maybe. But 4000 seems like a lot. I mean, is there something we can do with that to help them? Or Pray. You... No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I mean, really, unless, and, and probably what they, and this is, this is unfortunate because, you know, it's that, I call it the psychology of the sale. So they're already emotionally involved. Yes. And so the expectation is they'll figure out some way to come up with the money, and it's called a gift. So that's what they're uh, anticipating is that if you want the house, this is what it's going to cost you. And I asked her, can you guys afford, I don't mean to be rude, but can you guys afford this if it goes up the following year? And she said, well, yeah, we can afford it, but, you know, it just threw me off guard. It's so surprising. And I get it, but I just figured I'd ask you guys while we were on this same topic that we were talking about. So one of the changes that happened in lending was supposed to prevent surprises that close to closing, right? So we were all supposed to get our you know, loan estimate. What yeah. used to be called good faith estimate, now it's called loan estimate, like three, three days. business days, right, ahead of time, so that nobody got surprised. Yes. Unfortunately, I have seen that that's not always happening. So. One of the things you might want to do, I know you're not her agent. Yeah. Right? Well, one of the things you guys might want to do as an agent is make sure that you're in close communication with the lender partner on the transaction to make sure that that information has been passed in a timely basis. Do lenders sometimes make some mistakes? Yeah, they do. But if you're working with a lender that consistently makes mistakes, that consistently the day before closing asks your clients for $4,000, you Find need another it. lender. Exactly. <laughs> and so the, yeah, and the other part of that is really as a real estate agent, you need to know what's going on with property taxes. So you need to have a good relationship with your title company also. Yeah. So you need to know if you're going to be selling a house, you should know which areas are going to be are going to have higher taxes, you know, and so that's, you know, that's part of it because, yes, the lenders can control their cost as far as, you know, what the lender is charging, but then the out for the lender is, oh, well, that's third party, that's property taxes, you selected that homeowner's insurance company, that was a lot more expensive than what I quoted, so... You know, it felt it's horrible for her. I mean, I honestly couldn't do much because she's in a contract with another realtor, and I told her to reach out to her realtor. Her realtor's not even responding on the emails that she's getting. So I, I didn't know what to say, you know, as a realtor and, you know, our other realtors that we're working with. I mean, I would never treat someone that way, but that's just me, and I couldn't say much because I, I'm not I'm going to be the last one to badmouth someone because I don't know this realtor, and I don't know the full situation. So I just kind of left it at that, but I said, hey, you need to ask them, you know, ask them about programs, like, because I did um, sit in on the webinar last week, kind of late, but I did sit on it, and, um, you know, I just told her, see if there's something that will help you, and they said, well, we can afford it. It's just, it was surprising to just get this right before, like two weeks before they're about to close. But they're still closing. Yes. So mm -hmm. that's the, that's the bottom that's line. That's the gate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, I'm so sorry, but my questions were um, coming back to when we were talking about the affordable programs is um, two questions. I, I think we're, you, you guys mainly were talking about Austin, correct, that these programs are for. So I'll look Except forward. for the state of Texas. The t okay. shack program is available anywhere in the state of Texas. Okay. Does not matter. Does not have to be in the Perfect. city of Austin. It doesn't have to be uh, urban or rural. It, none of that, it goes into the equation. Okay. And the also, geography is Texas. And also the loans can be either FHA, uh, government loans, or conventional loans. So that's the okay. other flexibility. So they, hey, this yeah. is great. Well, they, have, <laughs> you have to answer. they still have to qualify for an FHA, USDA, VA, conventional loan. Okay. And then there is the layering with the down payment assistance. Are there any programs out there for seniors? You know, we have a lot of people who are retiring, and unfortunately, sometimes their retirement. Income eligibility. 
You need to start so thinking sorry, in terms of yes, income eligibility. <laughs> doesn't matter whether you're a senior, doesn't matter whether you're single. recently divorced, whether you're a single parent with three kids, it's income eligibility. eligibility. And it doesn't matter how old you are. It does not matter how old you are. Okay. I was just curious if there was something in that bracket of, of that no. time. There, th we need to start stop thinking in terms of there's a certain part of if you're in this bracket, there's a program for that. Okay. Or if you're in this bracket, you're, there's a program for that. Um, okay. Unless you're a veteran, that's the only bracket. Okay. okay? <laughs> well, my other question is, um, in, in the, in the um, program for affordable housing, um, whenever, a, hus whenever a, a family, the husband and wife are not married, how does that work? Is it only based off of... Can it be based off of both of their incomes? Actually, I can help answer that one. Okay. On our down payment assistance program, if they're using our down payment assistance program only, and we are going to, to determine that AMFI, that 80% AMFI, we are going to use whatever the lender has used on the 1003, on the loan application. So if the, um, you said the, I guess a non-purchasing spouse yeah, I'm where just, I'm just thinking outside the box because yes. there's tons of scenarios that happen all the time and so you know right so some programs require that all household members incomes be calculated whether okay. they're on the mortgage loan or not and actually our mortgage credit sure, certificate program is like that you would have to count all household members incomes to determine that AMFI amount, okay. but for our down payment assistance program, we're only going to use the income for the borrower. So if Aunt Ellie okay. has Social Security, she's not going to uh, ruin the opportunity for her nephew to get the home. Um, so it's only based on the borrower's income. Okay. That's, that's all I had. <laughs> Thank you. Were there any other questions? Yeah, I've got one. Oh, okay. Real quick, it's me. Yes. Sorry. Um, so, you know, we talked. We started a little bit about talking about the construct of our market today, uh, much of which is defined by through public policy, through land use planning, and you know the the code and all of the things that that create the context that you guys work in today. So, I would ask all of you, maybe or whoever wants to jump in this, what what uh, how meaningful is the redevelopment of the land use code in Austin in the context of affordable housing? And what do we need to be advocating for? Come on, Blanca, that's for you. <laughs> she's, she's thinking about it. I'm thinking, I'm thinking because of, you know, what's happening in Southeast Austin with uh, Easton Park yeah. and uh, that controversial development. I think that that is, um, it, it was creative and it's needed, but it, it wasn't thought out right. Mm -hmm. um, but we need more of those developments to to keep more folks in Austin and keep it affordable and those those units will be affordable forever mm -hmm. um, and and so that but we need to do more of that and the, the they're still doing i think I think they're still working on their project on the land use they're redoing the land use um, so they the city needs to do more to to um, do more affordable housing and I'm and, and and unfortunately when some of the city folks when they when they talk about affordable housing they talk about rental units and now and not uh, units for sale homes for sale whether it be condos or townhomes or single family housing so we we um, we need to do, we need to become part of whatever committees they are, whatever commissions they are. We need to be, as realtors, get, get involved so we can be part of the conversation, be at the table. So um, that's what we need to do. I, I, I know that Easton Park took us by surprise. I, we had no idea that was coming on. And so I, I'm glad there's going to be a lot of homes available, but it's going to be at a cost that's very high to a lot of folks. I think there's going to be a lot of changes to that coming. And I'll, I'll add to that. I think one of the things you can do is also to listen in to um, city council meetings. You know, you can pick up city council meetings on Thursdays, even if you can't go down there to attend. 
You can go to the, the city's website and, and listen to it that way. Um, you can listen to it from KZI to do their TuneIn app, and you can listen to from your your phone. You can go to, when you go to the city's website, you can see the agenda, so you can see what's on the agenda and what's coming up. Um, because I, I do think it, it requires being more proactive because they work in a bubble down there. You know, they see the same people, and if the people they're seeing are the developers, and the developers are meeting with staff, and I, I'm, I, this is not anything negative to the city of Austin, because I worked at the city of Austin for two years in their housing department, but I can tell you the politics is tremendous. So real estate agents, as well as the Austin Board of Realtors, you've got to have a voice down there, because it, it does make a difference. need to be creating housing where they're they're building for the buyers and that means that bringing their costs down um, so where do we start as far as getting ourselves involved if you could guide us <laughs> well <laughs> I was let me like, in coach uh, you know I, I, I would encourage you personally to get engaged through the Austin Board of Realtors through the Government Affairs Department on public policy teams each of which are oriented around specific issues of interest transportation water development issues these issues that we're talking about right now related to land use um, they meet monthly and Andre Lubomirov at the back, back of the room would love to take a business card and get you involved in those meetings and be aware of what what ABOR is advocating for so that if that doesn't look quite right to you or you've got questions about how that policy came about or you think you could improve upon our thought process, um, we want to hear that and we need to hear that. A diverse group of voices is what improves ABOR's ability to engage the city and say we've got this really strong constituency that sees this issue from all sides. Um, ABOR launches an annual public policy agenda that outlines our interest in a variety of areas of interest. You should find that public policy agenda on abor.com under the advocacy tab and just check out what we are saying on your behalf to be sure that that lines up for this marketplace. Code next. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do terms just real quickly, and then I'll and then I'll turn it back over to you. Code next is the process by which the land development code in the city of Austin is being redeveloped. That's the project name that they've given it. The land use code dictates everything about what we're talking about, where houses belong, what houses look like, how affordable or not affordable they are. It dictates all of it, and it's in, in, intrinsically at the center of your business in the city of Austin. Code Nexus is meeting, they're meeting all the time. There are public input opportunities, there are committee meetings, there, it is like death by a project. Um, and then Imagine Austin is the name of our comprehensive plan. It's essentially like the strategic plan for the city. What do we want to look like? Do we want to be connected or disconnected? Do we want affordable housing or do we not want affordable housing? Do we want to be dense or not dense? It's supposed to give a, a, the, the coloring book for what Austin should look like moving forward. Code Next should help us figure out how to color that thing in. What are the actual process, the actual context by which we will grow and manage the growth that we are experiencing every single day. So they're really, really important projects. We want you guys to be engaged. We would love you to be engaged through us. If that's not feasible for you and you want to go straight to the, you know, the, the talking head, then go for it, guys. We just want you engaged in this process because it's so important to you and your clients and our future. Absolutely, yeah, and ABOR's got a great partnership with Leadership Austin. Uh, Leadership Austin began as an organization that was affiliated with the Chamber of Commerce and then split off to be its own entity and its own voice. It is a group of alumni of some of the, the greatest and best community minds and leaders we have in this area. Um, they have wonderful programs that will introduce you to all of the issues that we are kind of addressing here and more. You know, think about how healthcare and transportation and, and housing are all interconnected and how do those things work together and what does that mean for our community. Um, they've got great kind of curriculum that you can run through over an, on an annual basis, but they also have a monthly breakfast series called Engage 
Austin. ABOR is the lead sponsor for the Engage Breakfast series. Um, their next meeting is May, I think it's 24th. It's whatever that Wednesday is, the week of the 24th. And it's actually going to, it's going to focus on, you know, how do we overcome party politics to have real dialogue about meaningful issues in our community. I don't care if you're a Republican, I don't care if you're a Democrat, but what, what are these issues that we are facing and how do we get rid of what's happening at the, you know, at the pulpit and talk about what's really happening on the ground, which is a great message for realtors because we, we value not on the basis of the party that you affiliate yourself with, but on the actions that you take. The outcomes that directly impact our membership and homeowners are the ways in which we evaluate who we endorse, who we support, and how we engage you. So it's really a great pairing to the way that ABOR works on your behalf as well. Thank you. Sandy, this question's probably more for you. You said earlier that we can fix all these things, but the foundation is really the issue. Um, and we haven't talked a whole lot about that today. So I'm interested in knowing if there's something currently going on being advocated for to get programs into the schools to educate high schoolers. Um, if there's something we can engage with, and if not, how do we, get, how do, we do that? <laughs> Um, I think the best way is if you are, can get involved with your school boards, you know, if you have kids, and that would be the way to do it, to have a voice at that level, um, because that's where it's going to start. I think it will take a grassroots initiative to make the changes at the school level, um, because it is also its own political entity. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Janie Taylor with the Texas State Affordable Housing Corporation. I work with Jonelle, and, and I do also um, uh, handle government relations. So I did want to say that on a, on a statewide level, there are, um, and Emily probably is familiar, there, there, are, there are laws and policies in place that um, can create barriers to creating affordable housing. And so beyond just what Austin can do, there are also things that you can probably look at engaging on a statewide level. I mean, there are, there are policies that prevent um, affordable housing to be built or for, for um, cities to enact ordinances um, to say, if you have to have a certain percentage of affordable housing in each development, and that's generally known as inclusionary zoning. Um, and, and that's something that, that's not possible in Texas. I think Texas is one of two. like two states in the whole country that doesn't allow that, those type of, of ordinances or policies to be adopted at a local level. So beyond what you can do in, in the city of Austin, I would look at what's going on in the statewide, um, at the legislature, which um, you should um, advocate for if, if that's um, the position. Um, and then in reference to um, financial education, um, there was a bill that passed a couple of years ago, I believe, um, that um, added some curriculum um, in the schools. It's very, very limited. Um, so there are groups like um, Race Texas. Um, they're called Race, like R-A-I-S-E Texas, which is um, an advocacy group that works for um, creating more financial education in the schools. And so that's a group that's going out there and advocating for changes. They also advocate for um, some changes to pawn shops and um, you know those type of um, payday loans um, that can sometimes create financial obstacles for people when, when they're trying to, to build financial uh, wealth and, and buy a home. So. Oh, and one more thing, sorry. Um, I think there were a couple of people that were talking about um, folks that are self-employed or they're entrepreneurs. There is an organization that's also a CDC, like Frameworks, called People Fund. Um, they're just down the street from where we're located in East Austin, and they are um, a nonprofit organization that works with um, business owners, um, especially small business owners. Excellent point. People Fund is an excellent resource for self-employed individuals to uh, learn about building a business, the different type of business structures, uh, business financing. They do provide small business loans. They're a community development financial institution, also known as CDFIs. 
community development financial institution, I would encourage you to encourage small businesses to engage in that nonprofit platform to learn about all the aspects of business. I think they uh, also partner with other resources that make a uh, business owner more successful and they, they get it, they understand what, what a business needs to do to grow, but also the individual business owner, what they need to do to be able to engage into home ownership and building assets and how to best structure their business to acquire homes and to build wealth. So CDFI, People Fund, it's the word people and the word fund as one word, peoplefund.org. And Larry, uh, Gary Linder is the uh, executive director or president and CEO of People Fund. So excellent points. And I do agree on the state level legislature on the state level, absolutely. Big Austin is also another resource. Thank you so much. So it's big, the word big and the word Austin joined as one word, bigaustin.org. They're another CDFI that provides uh, uh, education and development for entrepreneurs and they also provide micro loans as well for small businesses who typically would not be able to uh, gain financing through your traditional financial institutions. So they are also another resource. Big, the word big and the word Austin, Big Austin and people fund. So they do coaching and it, you know that kind of thing. So those are the, to thank you for bringing Big Austin. And I do wanna add one piece about Leadership Austin. You can actually seek to become a part of Leadership Austin's program. I'm a graduate of the Leadership Austin 2012 class and it deals with all the platforms, housing, transportation, education, uh, housing, and they bring in folks that are in at the top of the conversations and meet with those folks and challenge what's being done to make changes in the city. So it's good to go to the breakfast, but if you can actually um, be your app, you can apply to be a recruit to be a part of the Leadership Austin program, then, and if your application is accepted, they may ask for letters of references, but if you can, if your application is accepted, and I know that it's a cost to join, to be um, a part of it, and um, but they do give scholarships, um, but I would encourage you to look into Leadership Austin, um, not only from the perspective of being engaged in the breakfast, but actually being a recruit or joining or becoming uh, a Leadership Austin um, Alum, participant, a yeah. participant, participant. Be, right, because and I bring after, it up after, after you graduate from it, yes. then you become an alumni, but yeah. if you're in it as a participant, then you're right in the thrust and throes of the, of the program itself. I'm, I'm class of 93, 94. Oh, you are? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I bring it up because applications are now being accepted. Yes, that's why I bring it to your attention. Yes. Because applications are being accepted now. Now my daughter is thinking of applying for it. There was totally. a question in the back. Yes, ma'am. I apologize if this question has been um, addressed already, but are there any down payment assistance programs for foreign nationals, or are they under that income eligibility classification? You want to repeat yourself, please, Sandy? Um, well, since she's addressing down payment assistance, I will let you let you talk to your, your program. Um, None. From a lending standpoint, again, keep in mind, they still have to qualify FHA, VA, conventional, USDA. So the first thing you have to do is to find a lender that's providing financing for foreign nationals. And nine times out of 10, it's not gonna be attached to any down payment assistance. So that's a tough one. Yeah, and I was going to mention that they would have to um, qualify based on the conventional and FHA guidelines as well. Now, if you'll give me your card at the end of the session, I'll be glad to talk to you and see what else we can find out for you. Now, there, there are lenders that do provide financing to foreign nationals. Um, I don't want to mention any particular names because I'm not sure how, um, but I'll, I'll give you their names so you can, because they do, especially especially banks that are involved in a lot of your um, border areas, that they're going to be more inclined to have a particular program available, but it is going to require, you know, 30, 40 percent down. It's yeah. going to require a higher down and payment. Interest, and the interest rate's going to be higher. higher. So. Yes, ma'am. 
couple of questions on that. With your T-Shack, are there lenders specifically for you? Do you have to go through your lenders to qualify for those um, assistance programs? Yes. Um, our lenders have to go through our education to be able to offer our products. We want them to be able to discuss with the borrowers all the specifics of the program. So yes, we do require that the lenders be approved. Um, you can go to our website and find a list of lenders. We have lenders all over the state. Um, I'm trying to think how many lenders there are on the list, a couple hundred. Oh, oh okay, so about 500. So there's you know, plenty of lenders out there that on that list that they can find one in their area mm -hmm. to work with. We have it organized by um, loan officer name, and then we even have a list of the actual companies. Okay. So, but yes, they do need to be approved to work yeah, with our there, program. There's some additional forms that, and so the training is what the lenders learn about to make sure that they're getting your um, your clients through the process to meet a contract closing date, and then they're not surprised because they didn't do this step A, you know that kind of deal. So they're the lender training component. You are you are qualified then to work with them. I'm assuming yes, that's yeah. correct. Then the other <laughs> it's the same thing for the another city. Another question for Bianca. With the Easton Park, how are they going to keep them affordable? I'm just cur curious how when they go to resell them, are they going to be able to keep them affordable? They're not going to be taxing the, um, the land. Throughout the life of Blanca, it's a it's a land trust, isn't it, Emily? Right. Here. It's a land trust. Right. Yeah. So the so the land is owned by another entity. It cannot be taxed as the as the home on top of the land will be. But the value goes up, though, doesn't it? The of value the goes up, but in but when you look at it at at the va at the appraisal, and you think about how how we appraise property, the land is sometimes more valuable, well, the structure. at least equally as valuable than well, as the structure. And to that note, and somebody else did bring it up, and I'm seeing more and more of it, and again with the income qualifications and such, um, or eligibility of the seniors. I mean, it's a real, I think, issue that really is never addressed in any of these programs that we come to talk to. I'm getting them over and over again where they're just not really, they won't qualify for those lower income, even just for the apartments, but they're just doing what they can to survive. They're getting their extra jobs and that pushes them over those lower income affordable apartments. But boy, it would be so nice for them to be able to, once they get taxed out of their homes, find something that they can purchase in the one to 150 price range that's doable. Um, you know, you've got your different ones. You know, you obviously have your ones that are, you know, we want them to sell their houses and they can move on and go buy their $400,000 house. Um, you know, we know the heck them for purchase. I mean, I know that that's out there, but there's not a whole lot out there for seniors and it's more and more. I mean, I'm getting it all the time. Here's the other nothing. thing I would recommend. If they're already in their home, um, you need to really find a really good reverse mortgage lender um, because maybe they should stay in their home and get the equity to live off of because uh, as well as they can use the equity to improve the property if it needs improvements. Mm -hmm. But again, you need to research and find um, you know, reverse mortgage lenders because it is a specialty. But that may be the solution instead of selling their house and trying to find another property, even if they pay cash on it, it they still have to deal with the property taxes. You know, it, a reverse mortgage could be a viable option. It could be, but it's still a very underserved market. I it think. is. And I don't think developers are really focusing on senior housing and the only. Um, most developers that apply for the low-income housing tax credit set aside by the federal government through TDHCA, Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs, when developers are applying for low-income housing tax credits, a lot of those developers are not applying to develop senior housing, which is a need because it is a growing population and it's going to continue to grow as the baby boomers move into retirement age. With the three to five-year wait exactly. on the current housing, there's a three to five-year wait list. Yes. And most yes. seniors obviously don't have that much time to wait for mm -hmm. somewhere to live. And it, the advocacy may also uh, be on the platform of like uh, code next to inspire or to provide more incentives for developers to build senior housing and affordable housing in a mixed income housing development making a set aside for you know for you know for seniors for the purposes of um, creating affordable housing within a, a transportation oriented district community to you know within a Todd so it's going to really be about advocacy sitting on yes. boards commissions yes. code next and really putting your voice out there to advocate for that community um, but 
right now the most um, prominent development for low income housing tax credit, I mean for seniors would be through a low income housing tax yes. credit um, development, but the developer has to be inspired to do that for seniors and that to be done within an, um, an area where there's transportation and there's, you know, public service other housing and other, yes. other, other, other basic need services. I would say that that's a good place to that's start. A place to that's start. a very good place to start. Yeah, there, there's a lot of developments for seniors, but they're at the high end level. Like the high end. Yeah, mm -hmm. at Lakeway. Yeah. One of the one of the things is uh, was touched on is talk to your uh, reverse mortgage specialist because they made a change in the past few years with a home equity conversion mortgage mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. where they can sell their house and purchase into another house and be responsible for their taxes. But it's a way of the senior being able to move down to a smaller property using the equity in their house they're selling. Yeah. And the key word was in that was a good reverse mortgage person. Good. I, 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 good. Yeah, exactly. I yeah, good. Not all of them. Are yeah. Just kidding. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much. This has been really affordable. Or affordable. <laughs> it's been very interesting, and the top of mind uh, subject matter seems to be affordability in Austin right now. And we're almost, I, I hear, different of, of the brackets, and I so appreciate the income eligibility instead of uh, separating into to brackets of like single moms or seniors and and of course I'm going to come up with another bracket but um, and that would be like the creative class and a lot of the artists musicians that um, and I'm a native Austinite so I've definitely seen a lot of changes in alumni for leadership Austin as well yay, yay. what class <laughs> um, but it seems that some of us keep mentioning brackets because there's strength in numbers or, you, you know, the little, little tribes get together. So in terms of, say, for instance, the creative class of musicians that are or artists that are completely getting uh, you know, priced out of Austin, are you suggesting something like Code Next to kind of lobby or come together? Or, or what is the education? Like if we were to bring a group of people together, single moms or seniors, to come get educated on a home buying process, what would that be like? As a realtor, I feel like I could lobby a group of clients that were like-minded people to come get educated because they may not do it individually. They, they may want their, their, their people, their, their little tribe to come and learn at the same time. Do you have any feedback on that or? I actually, uh, you know, the Texas Commission on the Arts and the city of Austin staff is now taking recommendations for the next 90 days. And I'm interested in what the, in getting involved in Code Next and seeing if there isn't uh, an expedited process for developers that want to give money for funds set aside for the arts. And I don't know if there's precedent for that, um, but my next question was gonna be if there are any programs specifically for artists or, or, or almost or, even this, and I completely uh, agree yeah. with that. And, and it seems like we're all kind of asking, like, where's the special program for that? But <laughs> even just the education piece, like, is there a class? Like, maybe we could put together a class that focuses on certain to to learn about the lending process or what you have to do in terms of being self-employed and. You know, it, the home buyer education mm -hmm. is home buyer education. Uh -huh. It doesn't matter about the class. It right. doesn't matter about the profession. It none of that matters. The home buyer education is going to take anybody, well, no matter well, I, what I guess their I mean, age. Like, literally, like a class or a group of people. Like maybe there's you know putting together a class of specifically for certain groups to like we're here mm -hmm. like. Exactly. Uh huh. It would be nice to team up with a lender. Oh, I'm sorry. So let me tell you that that's a marketing opportunity for you, yeah. right? And so whatever group that you are in the. Uh, either the head of the tribe or a member of the tribe is your opportunity to market that group. So if it's the creative types, could you not get a creative type on a Saturday that says we're going to talk just to you? 
and you're going to bring your lender and maybe there's a couple other people that you can bring to support you and have a class specifically for your target group, for your target area. It will grow your business, it will grow your brand, it will grow your pocketbook. Yes, that's exactly what I'm trying to so, so you're going to schedule that in the next 30 days? And you and your, and your lender? And you got a volunteer here? I love that. Don't you love that? Anybody else want some money? Come on. I actually have a consumer class that we are working on right now that I would suggest you get in touch with me and maybe we can help you. Yes. Are you a maroon? I am a maroon forever. Let me kind of help wrap up. Let's give our panel and experts a hand. Weren't they awesome? If you take nothing else out, um, understand that we live in a growingly which not should mean to should mean to you opportunity. You should look at it as, gosh, this is great. How do I take this on? How do I make more money? One of my favorite, um, if you have ever taken a class from me, it says you can get rich in a niche. Y'all should write that down. That was good. <laughs> you can get rich in a niche. It's finding your niche. Where is your tribe? How do you build your tribe? How do you go after that and still do fair housing? Yes. Still make sure you're honoring and not treating people differently, but people have different needs. And we want to be in an area and in a group that we feel comfortable and accepted in. Don't we all want to be doing, able to do that? Mm -hmm. So the, wherever your tribe is, find out that's your opportunity, right? And you can find people to partner with. Find people that have the same goal, the same mission as you do. Take advantage of the resources that you learned here today. I, on purpose, ask them, how do they get in touch with you? Did you notice that? On purpose, I asked that question. Because after you leave here today, you may have a question. You may want to go back and contact somebody that spoke here today. You may not have wanted to ask your question in you front of you, know, you might want to be able to do it privately, right? So take advantage of the resources of the people that you see here. And, and Miss Emily, I'm telling you, there's so much knowledge there. Yes. Oh my God. Right? So if you want to know what's going on in the city and how it impacts housing in yes. any way, Miss Emily yes, yes. Is, is the source of the source of information overflowing, overflowing. Okay, all minds clear. All minds Any clear. question? Oh, yes, ma'am.
Renee, can I also add that when your your uh, buyers are uh, purchasing homes and are applying for down payment assistance or mortgage mortgage credit mortgage credit mortgage credit mm -hmm. MCC certificate. certificate programs that they do need to acquire a certificate from a certified home buyer education counseling agency um, which they recognize so um, I strongly agree that these um, affiliate entities and platforms for education is good uh, however to be able to qualify for down payment assistance programs all across the state, whatever those programs are. The certificate from a approved housing counseling home education program is required for those down payment programs. I just wanted to put that out there. Yes. Yeah, so you can find them on the website. I left the paper on um, the tables. You can find them on the website uh, for the area that your home buyer is purchasing. No, and I was just going to say, when you when you do Online. this as individual groups, the different associations, you may want to maybe not say it's a education. Maybe you say education training. It's like an orientation, you know, because they feel comfortable with you, um, but you're kind of getting them started, so then you can easily direct them to where they need to go to get the actual certification. So they you're, so they're not saying, well, we just did this with you. Why do we have to do this again? Intro and then they're not to home buying. That's related to home. Intro. Well, very good point because exactly. education so, and introduction are two you know, different things. Do it that way so because then, then they're going to be mad at you as the real estate agent that you didn't tell them you weren't transparent. Right. They assume that going through you was going to make them eligible for these programs. So you, you, you kind of want to be careful how you couch your education training. You guys were awesome. Thank you for filling out our form. Have a great day. It was great. Yeah, I enjoyed Thank it. You. Thank you. You're wonderful. Thank you. Nice to meet you.